All right, joining me now is former Cleveland Browns quarterback and 12-year NFL veteran Kelly Holcomb. Kelly played with the Browns from 2001 to 2004, and he's kind enough to join us here today. So, Kelly, thanks for taking the time. Absolutely, man. Thank you all for having me. Yep. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank Andre Davis for helping to set up this interview. Andre is one of Kelly's former teammates in Cleveland. Uh, I'm talking about the receiver, not the linebacker. Well, that's right. Andre, Andre instead of Andre. Right, right. And uh, he commented on one of my videos a couple months ago, and I just took a chance and replied to his comment. And luckily, he responded. So I um, want to thank Andre Davis again. So let's just jump right to it. For today's interview, Kelly, I'd like to briefly touch on your college career, but spend most of the time talking about your pro career, if that's fine with you. Absolutely. Uh, so let's get started here. Um, coming out of high school, like, what was the recruiting process like for you? Um, well, you know what, I, I went to a, uh, I, it was, th it was three levels of uh, high school football here. So I was in the biggest level, but I was from a small town. I wasn't very big, which is, you know, a little bit what my son's running into right now. I, I weighed, I literally was telling somebody on the phone today, I weighed 157 pounds. I, I, I went to, uh, I had a recruiting visit to middle Tennessee. I really liked that. I went to Tennessee and then I was supposed to go to Alabama the next week that I went to middle and I called Alabama and told them that. Uh, hey, I decided that I, I would go to MTSU. And, you know, looking back on it, I probably should have took the visit, but, hey, it, it, it kind of worked out. So you kind of answered my next question. You ended up at Middle Tennessee State. Uh, I was going to ask you where would you have gone next, but you said Alabama. Yeah, I grew up uh, I grew up in Fayetteville, Tennessee, which is about 50 miles south of where I live now. It's, uh, it's right on the Alabama-Tennessee border. And, you know, my, my hometown is kind of split in half. You're either a UT fan or you're an Alabama fan. And I literally couldn't stand UT growing up, and I'm from the state. Uh, I always grew up as an Alabama fan. I was a big Bear Bryant guy. And actually, my high school coach uh, played under Bear Bryant. Um, he was with Joe Namath on, I think he got, I think he won two national championships with those guys, Griff Thompson. So, uh, you know, uh, Mal Moore was the guy that was recruiting me. And he kind of told him, hey, all you got to do is ask him and he'll come. And he would call me every now and then. But my, my college uh, quarterback coach that I told you about, he, he's like a dad to me. I mean, I talked to him at least once or twice every week. And, uh, he, he, you know, the, the NCAA rules were different back then. I remember looking up and, and one of the other guys that was getting recruited by middle said, your boy's here again today. And I could not stand seeing him because it seemed like he was there every day at my school trying to trying to get me to come. And, um, you know, it turned out that 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 was the best place for me. It was small, uh, the great community, although the community is getting crazy big right now. But uh, uh, back then it was small and it was what I needed. And, and I'm certainly glad that I came here. Interesting, yeah. Uh, talk about your time at Middle Tennessee State. Uh, man, I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, I've already told you a lot of it. Uh, I was close to home. I was only 50 miles away. So, I, you know, as a young kid, you know, not being away from home, I don't – you know, I got a little homesick, but I don't know if you can get too homesick being 50 miles away. So, uh, that, that was a good thing that my parents could come and watch, and it was only 50 miles away. And then, you know, we played in the OVC, which wasn't, wasn't really bad. I mean, there wasn't really any – any long, long trips, you had to go to Moorhead State, you had to go to Eastern Kentucky, but, you know, other than that, it was, well, SEMO was pretty, Southeast Missouri was pretty, uh, it was a pretty good ways, but, uh, you know, I enjoyed it, man. I, I had a, I got a lot of good friends that I still talk to, a lot of good college teammates that I still talk to. I, I had lunch with one the other day, and uh, for, uh, unfortunately, one of my, uh, one of my good friends, his, his father passed away a couple of weeks ago, and I was able to go to his funeral, so I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys, and it was, uh, you know, we had a we had a great uh, group of guys that, um, you know, when we played Florida State, we had 22 dudes that could play. You know, the, the unfortunate thing when you go up against big schools like that, they've got so many guys that they can just, uh, you know, they can just bring guys. It seemed like, you know, we played Nebraska the next year, and it seemed like they were bringing, you know, they would they would go one series with five offensive linemen, and then they'd bring totally another five offensive linemen in, and we still got the same guys out there so uh we, you know we had some guys that, that went on to play in the nfl but um you know it's hard when you've got that least number when you got that little number of guys that could play but you don't have many reserves for them so that's where we got into trouble but man i wouldn't change it for the world it's where i live now i used to come back when i was in indianapolis or cleveland or buffalo i would come back here and and um, you know before my kids went to school you know we would come back here and stay till the till the off-season program started back so it's um 
you know, I love Middle Tennessee. I love going to school there. If I had it to do over again, I would definitely do it over again. It had to be the same guys that was coaching. You know, that was a, that was a different time and era back then, but it had to be the same guys that coaching. But I'm certainly glad I met my wife there. Um, you know, I live here now, so it was uh, it was where God intended me to go. Awesome, yeah. Um, so as a player, what would you say your most memorable moment there was? Uh, I don't know, just being able to win an OBC championship with the guys going into going to the one double A playoffs three out of the four years, probably should have gone four out of four, but you know, we had a bad year one year. Uh, we let some things get out of hand on, on, on the team level that we should not have done. And, you know, the coaches can only handle certain things. And then, you know, you have to police yourself. And we didn't have a very good year that year. But, you know, I don't know if there's one um, if there's one moment. I know that, you know, in the in the Florida State game, uh, you know, as a true freshman, I, like I said, I weighed 160 pounds. And I was going up against Casey Weldon, who Casey Weldon became one of my good friends when I was at Tampa Bay. Uh, Casey Weldon and Amp Lee and Terrell Buckley and Kirk Carruthers and Marvin Jones and all those dudes. But, you know, as a true freshman, I set a school record. I completed 13 straight passes on the number one team in the nation, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> Didn't even know what I was doing, you know. But uh, uh, I, I don't know if there's one single moment. You know, you always play to win championships, but the things that you miss as a player is, is relationships, being in the locker room. You know, going through all the stuff that you really don't like going through at the time, you know, I wish I could go back and practice one more day. I wish I could go back out and work out one more day with the guys or or do the off-season program. I, I just think it's – instead of one moment, I just think it's the the conglomeration of all of them together, just being with a, a group of guys that, you know, we sweat together, we bleed together, we, you know, we cry together when guys get upset. We, you know, we hold each other accountable. I just think it's – a that's what the great thing is about sports, and that's what the great thing is about football. There's, like, I, I mean, there's, you know, it's different now, and it's getting different every day with all these rules and things. But uh, I just think there's, it's so unique because you're out there with ten other guys, and and there's just something about being in the huddle with those guys, and everybody's watching, and everybody's yelling at you and screaming at you, and you know, it's such a great sport. It, it just teaches so many lessons because. When you're on offense, if, if one person, you know, does wrong, that can script the whole play. So you have to learn how to, you know, to to play as a team, to to bind as a team, to, you know, just to do everything together. And I think that's why football is so great. Right, right. So moving on to your NFL career, you entered the draft in 1995. Uh, you wound up going undrafted. Were you disappointed by that or is that what you expected? Uh, no, I was, you know, you, you... – you're, um, when you look back on it, you are disappointed in that because I, I can remember I had uh, I had a couple of teams come work me out and you know I even had you know Coach Gruden uh, you know and I saw him years later at Peyton's camp uh, and we talked but uh, he, he actually came up I don't even know if he remembered but he came up to here to to work me out and you know you, you get a lot of this and that but you know he's like I really like you he's like you're you're who we you're the best guy we worked out so far but. You know, you never know what's going to happen in the NFL. And I found out really quick that it was a business. It didn't take me long to, to understand that. And when you're paying guys so much money, it becomes a business. And, you know, I was a little upset that I didn't go. But, you know, my agent tried to explain to me, and this is what I try to tell younger guys, if if you go into the draft and, and people don't believe this, but, like, if you're a sixth or seventh round guy, you know, what, what if you go and you're a seventh-round pick? What if you go to a guy that's already got three quarterbacks that are pretty established or two quarterbacks that are pretty established and they've had another guy on the roster? You know, when when you go as an undrafted free agent, then you kind of pick your best situation. If you've got a – and I had a couple of them. I had a – you know, I could have gone to New England or the Jets or Tampa Bay. I had three – three, and I, I don't think I – I don't remember anymore. But, I mean, I still had options. And then you kind of get to look at that and see where you fit best and what they do as an offense or what they've got before you. And I've told people that and they think you're crazy because they just want the status of being drafted. And, you know, I would have loved to have the status drafted. I, I thought that I was going to get drafted in the fourth round by the Eagles. But, um, you know, it didn't it didn't turn out that way. I definitely wanted to get drafted, but, you know, hey, it was one of those deals that, I remember when I went to Tampa Bay, Turk Shona, which was a quarterback coach, he's like, don't worry about how you came in, just worry about how you go out. And I really, I really stuck in the back of my mind. It's not how you come in, it's how you leave. 
and I was able to leave on my own terms. And I, you know, I played. I know you said twelve, but I actually got thirteen, which they didn't count. Yeah, that, that's no, that's fine. They didn't count that one year, uh, which I think they count now. Which I, I don't know if they gave me that year or not. But um, you know, it was it's something where when you don't get drafted, everybody's like, "Well, you didn't get drafted." You, you, well, you know, I was able to make it a lot longer than most people make it. So in '95, you were picked up by uh, Tampa Bay, but as a practice squad player. Uh, it'd be in '96. You get a real roster spot with the Colts, correct? I did. Yes, absolutely. And when you got to Indy, like, what was your mindset? Did you think you could rise and eventually become the starter? Because I think uh, was it Jim Harbaugh was the quarterback. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh was a quarterback, and then Paul Justin was the uh, he was the backup. Paul Paul helped me out quite a bit, and then Kerwin Bell, which uh, you know I've kind of reconnected with his son. He's at Western Carolina now, but uh, Kerwin was the other quarterback, and and. You know, that was that was pretty rough right there because Kerwin uh, was a Florida guy and Lindy and Fonny was the coach and Lindy and Fonny was a Florida guy. So they, they kind of had a relationship. And, you know, I don't know, you know, Kerwin was an older guy. Uh, you know, I had to go in. I had to fight for everything. So it was, uh, you know, it was just one of those deals where you go in and you just do what you can do. And I can always remember my, my college coach. I, I'll, I'll go back to him quite a bit because he is like a father to me. But. He always used to tell me, and this is another thing that stuck in my head, you always want to make people make a decision on you. And that was my mindset. I always wanted to make, like, you know, if you go into those meetings, as people have seen on Hard Knocks, they talk about you. And sometimes they don't talk very good about you. But I just wanted to, when they brought my name up, and I wasn't in those meetings, don't know what was said, but I just wanted to know that I did what I needed to do on the field to make them say, hey, we need to give this Hoping kid a look. That was my whole mindset going into camp or my whole, whole mindset, you know, just trying to make a team was to make those guys make a decision about me. Just, you know, do as much as you can, work as hard as you can, study as much as you can, know as much as you can. You know, when, when you get your opportunity, when you go in there, you, you do what you're supposed to do. You handle the offense when you got checks, you knew what to do. And that was kind of my whole mindset. Just make those guys make a decision about me. Right. So uh, Peyton Manning arrived in 1998. When he was there, did you get to know him very well? And if so, what was he like? And do you guys still talk today? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Peyton and I played for uh, for three years. Uh, you know, when, when Peyton first came in the league, he, he had a, you know, he didn't stay out long, but he had a contract dispute for a couple of days. So I was able to, you know, I was able to uh, take the first team reps, and you know, I can remember Jim Jim Moore, which was the coach. He, he brought me in his golf cart one day and says, "Hey, I really like what you've been doing these last couple of days. You keep doing what you're doing. You're a good football player." And that's you know that's another thing that stuck with me. So I knew when he you know when a coach tells you that, you know, kind of gives you a little confidence in yourself that that you, you you're doing the right things and and you know you're making those people make a decision on you. But uh, yeah, Peyton, when he came in, uh, you know, he was well-groomed, uh, obviously going to a big school, UT, and, you know, his dad had played uh, His dad had played in the National Football League for a long time, so he kind of groomed him into that. Uh, you know, I know his dad was kind of hands-off, but, you know, obviously Peyton learned a lot of things from his dad. I'm sure Peyton, Peyton is, a, is a detailed, question-asked type of guy, and I'm sure he asked his dad a lot of questions, but he was – he was by far the most prepared guy I had ever been around. Uh, the guy I watched film constantly. He actually taught me me more than I ever taught him. You know, I can remember getting there early in the morning and staying up late at night watching film with him. And he would even stay later than I would. I mean, I, I was married and uh, had a daughter. So, uh, you know, he would stay even later than I would. He, he would go eat He would go eat some of the coach's meals because he would stay there. And then I think, you know, when, when technology is – has rolled around and you know I think he set up something in his house where he didn't have to stay at the facility but he still was able to watch all the films so you know back when he first started he had to stay at the facility so he um you know he he kind of taught me a lot about you know preparation and things like that he, you know his first year he you know we weren't very good uh he, we didn't have a lot of blocking uh you know and he but he got rid of that football because he was prepared he knew what he was going to do and that kind of you know, that kind of taught me a lot. I, I, I was always kind of like that anyway. I knew what I was doing, just get rid of the football. I was not a runner like they are nowadays. I, I wasn't trying to make plays with my feet. Now, I could, you know, I could I could uh, lengthen a play. I could, I could get out of the pocket and do things like that. But I had to use my mind about, you know, if I had to change protections or if I had a hot, hot read that I had to throw, I, I understood stuff like that. And that was a good thing. 
you know, being around Peyton, he kind of, you know, he was kind of the same way. You know, you have to know what you're doing. You have to watch a lot of film, have to study your opponent and know, you know, like little, little details of like, is this guy coming? What's going to happen if he rotates? What's going to happen if this dude comes? Or the defensive line is going to, you know, they're going to zone blitz you or things like that. So he was uh, he was really good at that. But, you know, I, I think that it's come out now. Uh, you know, Peyton was kind of a jokester. We, we always had fun with that. We, you know, I, and something came up on Facebook the other day. I think it was Facebook or Twitter or something like that. But, you know, I told somebody, you know, and I recapped, uh, Peyton was a jokester. He, he and I joked around with each other a lot. and We played a lot of pranks on each other. But I can remember being in Terre Haute uh, at, um, at Rose Homan where we went to uh, training camp. And he would always come in my room because Peyton's cheap. He's not going – he wasn't going to get a TV. So he'd come in and watch TV in my room. So one night I left and I'm like, I got down the steps. I got into my car. Literally when I got out of the parking lot, I'm like, why did I leave this dude in my room? So when I came back, uh, I had to go to Walgreens or something. I forget what it was. But when I came back, uh, I was like, I, I see guys peeking out of the corner and I see guys, uh, somebody, somebody had a video camera. And I go downstairs in the lobby. I think I was on the second floor or the third floor. But he had a bunch of offensive linemen and some tight ends help him. He, he literally took my whole room and put it on the on the uh, lobby floor. He took my bed, he took all my clothes, he took my TV, he took my chairs, he took everything that I had and he put it on the lobby floor. So we had some good times, man. We messed with Steve Walsh, which was another dude. So we 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 had some good times, man. It wasn't all about football, but uh, you know, he's kind of a joke. So I think you kind of see that when you see him on a Saturday Night Live skit. You can understand he's kind of he's really witty and uh, you know, I think I'm on a lot of his commercials now. I mean, he's a commercial mogul guy, but uh, I, I'm going to be interested. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting because I, you know, I, I'm going up to his Hall of Fame deal August the eighth. So that's actually a week ago from today. So a week from now. So uh, I'm I'm interested to see you know a lot of my former teammates and getting to getting to see him getting inducted in the Hall of Fame. So that'd be pretty cool. It's funny you say that about the prank they pulled on you because my roommates in college did the exact same thing. Oh, yeah. He, but, I, I, you know, it was my fault. I, you know, I knew because we'd already pulled a bunch of pranks on on each other. And, you know, I knew that uh, when I left, I'm like, why did you allow this dude to stay in your room? I, I just I, I, like that was on me. I was stupid enough to do it. And I knew that he was going to do something. So but I, I got him back. I got him back. I can't tell you what I got him back with, but I got him back pretty good. <laughs> hey, I'm sure they'll be watching this. So that'll be kind of funny. Um <laughs> So how much playing time did you end up seeing with the Colts? Man, it wasn't, it wasn't much. It wasn't much at all. I mean, when, when Harbaugh was there, you know, Harbaugh and, and he and Paul Justin kind of got fortunate to give me, I, I think I started, I started one game against the Cincinnati Bengals. And I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready uh, at that point. Uh, because it was a little different. I mean, it was a little different. That was, I think that was my rookie year. But when Peyton got there, man, Peyton took every snap. I mean, he's one of those guys that's kind of like a, he's an Iron Man guy. He wants to take all the snaps. And I can remember there was there was one or two games. I can remember we was playing the Philadelphia Eagles. And I think we beat those guys 44-6. to six. But, you know, that was kind of a, a mantle of armor for him. He wanted to take every snap. It's, it's kind of like the Brett Favre deal where, you know, he wanted to take every snap during the season. So, you know, I knew that when my, uh, when my contract, came up that, you know, if I wanted to play, because I, I, you know, I, I'm not one of those guys that like to, you know, everybody says, you had the greatest job in the world. You could just, well, you know, that's, that's cool for you. But like, if you're competitive and you want to play, you want to, I don't want to hold a clipboard. You know, I, you know, everybody says, well, hey, you can make a lot of money holding a clipboard. And I'm like, okay, well, if you want to do that, that was fine. But I'm not, uh, like, that's not my personality. I wanted to play. And I, I thought that, you know, after, you know, I played with Peyton for two years, was it two years? Yeah, three years. Uh, after I, after that third year, man, I was like, he's never going to come off the field. You know, he's never going to come off the field. So if I wanted to play, I needed to go somewhere. Unfortunately, Bruce Arians went to be the offensive coordinator at Cleveland Browns, and he brought me with him, which was, you know, that was kind of my, was kind of my deal where I got my, you know, I got my way in there, and and you know, I had a guy that was with me, that knew me, that trusted me, that had confidence in me, and you know, carried me with him because he knew that I knew his offense, what he was going to run, and then we went to Cleveland together. Cool. So that brings us to your time with the Browns. Um, and I think you might have just answered it, but how did you get there? Was it through trade or free agency? Free agency. I, I had a chance to go back to Indianapolis, but 
uh, they, they offered me to stay, but, um, I, like, I, like I just said, I mean, I knew that if I wanted to play football, that I was going to have to get behind, get from behind Peyton because he was just, you know, he's, he's a, he's a really good player. That's why he's going in the hall of fame next week. So, uh, you know, and he's one of those guys that, you know, he worked really hard. You know, I didn't want, I, nobody wants anybody to get hurt, but you knew if, if, you know, if he got rid of the ball so fast, he was so prepared and, you know, the offensive line was really good. Uh, you know, and, and hey, the guy won a Super Bowl. He won, he won so many games in Indianapolis. It was ridiculous. I mean, that's, you know, that was the deal. And I, I just knew that if I wanted to play, I had to do something else. And, that, you know, I was fortunate enough that Bruce went to uh, went to the Browns and he was offensive coordinator and he carried me to kind of mentor and, and help Tim Couch with the offense. And, you know, it kind of went from there. Right. So you arrived at Cleveland in 2001 and you're Tim Couch's backup because he starts all 16 games that year. Right. I still right. want to ask you about two games from that season. Uh, the game in Chicago, you guys were up 21 to 7 with like a minute left. That was, uh, that was ridiculous. Yeah, I remember that game because one of my good buddies was was uh, was playing. Uh, Shane Matthews was playing that game. And yeah. uh, it was 21 to 7. And that was literally – they literally got the ball back. I, I don't know how much time it was, but they literally scored with 58 seconds left on I don't know what they scored on but they got the onside kick they got the ball closer and they hit a Hail Mary and it was like literally in under two minutes I mean they scored 14 points under two minutes which you know it shouldn't happen but some sometimes things like that I can just remember uh guys on the sideline you know and this this is kind of the the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. But, you know, we were, you know, when, when you get to 21 to seven and there's like a minute, 37 seconds left in the game. And I, I don't know exactly how much time it was. I hope it was under two minutes, but you know, you kind of turn around, you start because those fans have been chirping in your ear all, all night long, all day long. And I can remember, you know, some of the guys looking around chirping back with them and then they score with like 58 seconds left. And then they get the onside kick. And they get a couple of plays and get it closer. I don't know if they had any timeouts, but they get a couple of plays closer. And then Shane throws a Hail Mary and they catch it in the end zone. And I'm like, you have got to be. And then, then we go into the overtime. And the first play of overtime, Tim throws a pick and they score. So they literally scored three touchdowns in a matter of under two minutes. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. And they, they end up winning the winning in the game. And I'm like, I, I don't like we, we were on the bus and we're like, we don't even know what just happened. You know, because you can't, you know, you just can't uh, when, when you're up 21 to seven and you've got that little time. I mean, we go over game type situations, you know, in professional football all the time. And you just can't let that happen. And, it, you know, you got to, you, you know, if they score, well, hey, they might score. But then you've got to do what it takes on that onside kick to recover that kick. And, you know, we didn't do that. And that was, that was one of those fluke deals where, we, yeah, we got beaten in under two minutes. Yeah, it's just, it seems like a bunch of those weird things happened, kept happening to the Browns over the years. They had a very similar game in New England uh, 2013. They were up 12 points with like two minutes left, and the same thing happened kind of. Uh, speaking of strange games, uh, Bottlegate, that's another game from 2001. Oh yeah, I remember that when the Jacksonville Jaguars. I can remember seeing guys. I, I was I was looking for my wife because she was on the bottom level, and I can I can remember, I can remember people just chunking beer bottles from the top of the stadium. I, that was, yeah, that was a crazy game, man. I, I don't remember much about that game. I do remember that game, uh, just just because I was looking around, just seeing just stuff come onto the field, and the referees trying to get off the field, and I don't even remember what all happened, but. Yeah, that was kind of a crazy game, too. Moving on from 2001, that takes us to uh, 2002, the magical 2002 season. Uh, this is where you got your first real action with the Browns. Tim Couch got hurt in the preseason, and as a result, you started the first two games in 2002. And you should have been 2-0, but we all know what happened with Dwayne Rudd. Um, this is where the quarterback controversy between you and Tim Couch was really born. What was it like getting all that attention for the first time in your pro career? Uh, I'm, eh, I mean, you just, I don't know when you're around that stuff, you know, you, you're used to talking to reporters, you're used to being in that. Uh, so it, it wasn't really a big deal to me. I mean, I, I think people try to portray myself and Tim as, as bitter enemies. I, I don't, 
I still talk to Tim today, man. He's one of my friends. So, uh, you know, we, we just, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know how, I don't know if I like the way that it was managed, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, that's professional football. And I think that when you, when you've got guys that you, as a coach, when you think that you've got one guy that you know can play and then the other guy comes on and he showed that he can play as well. I think when you've got two guys and then, you know, I don't think it, I don't know if it, I don't know if this was the case, but like subconsciously, you know, I don't think that you can play to your highest peak ability when you know that in the back of your mind, hey, you've won a starting job, but if you don't play as well as you're supposed to, then they got somebody that they can put in there or that guy gets in and, you know, Tim gets in and he's got the same thinking with me. We got to go in and we got to play really lights out or they're going to put the other guy in. I, I just don't think that you – that's a hard situation to be in. I thought we handled it pretty good. Uh, you know, I think when we went to the playoffs that year, I think we had a really good team. And for whatever reason, that that deal was, you know, dismantled. I think we, uh, you know, you talked to all those guys and all those guys wanted to stay because, hey, when you're in Cleveland, those guys, you know, the, the organization, when we were there, they treated you well. I mean, we had, we had a barber that was on site. You know, they would start our cars in the wintertime when we was, at, you know, away on trips. They would start our cars. I mean, they would shine your shoes. They would do things for you. I mean, I can remember walking in the door the first day and they say, money is no object here. We want to, you know, we had, we had masseuses come in and give us, you know, massages every Monday and Friday. And it's just a great organization to be a part of. And, and there's no better place in the world to play football. And that's kind of where it started in the state of Ohio and being, you know, obviously Cleveland and, you know, Paul Brown and he, he started the organization and, you know, having Jim Brown there and, and the days of the cardiac kids. I mean, if you just win in Cleveland, you're you're treated so well there. The, and I, I just, I've hated it for so many years. I know I said 2001, but 2002 was the last time we were in the playoffs, but before last year. But, you know, if you just win there, those people love the Cleveland Browns. And I know that, you know, LeBron was there with the, with the Cavs and I know the Indians have been really well, really, really good the last couple. But if you're a Cleveland Brown, you can win there. There's no better place in the world in the National Football League to play football. And I know every team says that. You know, you go to Green Bay or you go out to the Raiders or, you know. But Cleveland is just – it's just a unique place where the people love the Browns. And, and they were so bad for so long and the, and the fans stayed with them. You know, and it's just, uh, you know, I love that. I love living there. I love that place. I thought it was a great place. And I, I'm, I'm glad to see them, like I said earlier, I'm glad to see them coming around and starting to win a lot of, go a lot of games again. Yeah, it's long overdue. Um, but sticking on 2002, so you started the first two games. I did, yeah. Tim Couch comes back in week three. Were you disappointed by that? Like, did you think, like, you kind of deserve to keep starting? I don't know. I mean, hey, like I said, it's a business. You don't you, you don't know what people are thinking. I mean, uh, you know, and, and money drives that business. I mean, Tim was the guy that's making the money. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, and he didn't do, at, at that point, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, he just got hurt. So, you know, it's just one of those deals where, you know, that, that was my, um, you know, that was my opportunity to go on the field and play and, and uh, you know, show what I was worth. And I, I thought I played. I know I got we got one win out of that against the Bengals. I think that uh, the the game before with Dwayne Rudd, you know, that was an unfortunate thing that happened. You know, we should have won that game, so it should have been two and zero. But you know, should have, could have, would have. We didn't. We didn't finish that game, and uh, we let Trent Green and those guys, Priest Holmes and those guys, get another opportunity to get a get a, another couple of snaps. And they kicked the field goal, which was another crazy game. Just like you said earlier, just uh, one of those deals in a crazy episode with the Cleveland Browns. Just right. Don't know why things happen sometimes like that, but they did. So, you know, I, I thought that I played well in those first two games. And, and uh, we, like I said, we should have been 2-0. and We weren't. But, uh, hey, Tom Moore told me when I first came in the league, there's something to be said about a guy that just works, keeps his mouth shut. You can stay in the league for a long time. And that kind of that's another thing that stuck with me. And I, I just, you know, I could have raised ruckus about it, but I, I'm just not that type of guy. I just wanted to be around. I wanted to win football games. I, you know, when I was called upon, I wanted to be ready to play. Right. So the Browns wind up going 9-7 and seven that year and making the playoffs, like you talked about. There were a lot of memorable games, crazy finishes. Uh, yep. I didn't start watching the Browns until 2004, but I've heard people were comparing that 2002 team to the Cardiac Kids team in the 80s. 
Um, and I guess you already talked about 2002, but are there any games to you that stand out to you during the regular season? Uh, no, not really. I just, I just remember going in that, uh, you know, that last game against Atlanta and I didn't play, I didn't play very well. Uh, you know, I can remember watching Michael Vick run around. I think Tim broke his leg. Um, you know, but it, it was one of those deals where it was kind of a magical season because, uh, uh Mr. Lerner, I can remember, he, you know, he came in and that was, uh, I think he had, he'd gotten sick. Uh, he got sick that year and I can remember him coming in and, and, his his dream was to, you know, see the Browns in the playoffs. That was his dream. And, you know, all the crazy things that happened, uh, we were able to give him that. You know, I can, I can remember that, you know, he got sick, and I think he had – I don't know when he passed away, but I can remember all of us going to the funeral. But, you know, he was able to see us make the playoffs, and I thought that was pretty – I thought that was pretty cool. That's kind of the one thing that stuck out to me other than, you know, being being able to come in in the Atlanta game, I didn't play very well. I threw you know I threw a couple of interceptions, uh, but you know when when time came, we ended up winning the football game, and you know then I was able to get a full week of practice and and going into that game, going in the Pittsburgh playoff game, I was able to get a full week of practice. And, you know, kind of got some time for me to you know have the game that we kind of had in that playoff game. Right. Uh, and you touched on this already. Uh, Tim Couch got got hurt in the final game of the season. So you ended up starting the playoff game versus Pittsburgh. Um, you kind of touched on the Atlanta game already, but I've heard multiple people say that Atlanta game was the only time the new Brown Stadium felt like the old stadium. So do, does, do you remember the atmosphere that day, like what that was like? Yeah, because we had to win that game. And, I mean, it was cold. I think it was – I don't know if it was spit and snow, but I remember it was cold. And we had to win that game to get into the playoffs. And, and I think we had to have some other things happen. I, I don't know. I can't remember, to be honest with you, I can't remember if it was a win and you're in situation or if somebody had – somebody else had to lose and we win. I just know that we had to win that football game. And, you know, the place was rocking. Uh, you know, it was loud. It was cold. It was right on the water. The wind was blowing. We playing by Michael Vick, and Michael Vick was running. I mean, he he, you know, made a. I think he was running around one time in a play last. It seemed like about ten seconds. Uh, just an unbelievable talent, unbelievable athlete. And you know, at the end, we had to win that game. I, I do remember at the very end, we got on the goal line. I think we're on our minus one yard line coming out, and and you know, it was. I don't think we could take a knee. We had, you know, because if you took a knee, it was, you know, it was that close. I think that we had, you know, you, you get it, you get a safety. So I think three plays in a row, I had to do a quarterback sneak, which I think quarterback sneak is the worst place, worst place play ever in the National Football League. Because I, a couple of years later, I got my leg broke in San Francisco on a quarterback right. sneak. We were kind of on the same place. So. I hate quarterback sneaks, but I had to do it three times in a row just to get us out, and I think we were able to run out the clock. So, uh, you know, that was kind of a crazy deal. But, uh, you know, we had to win the game. We did win the game. The atmosphere was great, and we were able to go on to the next week to the wild card game. Yeah, I remember that game itself didn't clinch a playoff spot, but a couple – it it helped you out. Like, you had to win that game. Yeah, we had, we had to win, and I, I'm not sure who had – it was something. It was something about the Jets. I, I seem to remember it was something about the Jets had to – they either had to lose or they had to beat somebody. I, I can't remember, but I, I can't – it seemed like – because I can remember talking to those guys. I remember talking to ESPN radio after the game, and they were going over all the scenarios, and the scenarios worked in our favor, so we, we were able to go on. Yeah, I think it was the Dolphins and the Jets. or A bunch of things had to happen, and luckily everything happened, so – uh, but moving on to that playoff game, like I said, you were starting for an injured Tim Couch, and you wound up having another monster game, or not another, but you ended up having a monster game, throwing for 429 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, you guys couldn't be stopped in the air. Like, so I consider myself a pretty big football fan, but I don't understand, like, the X's and O's that well. So can you, like, break it down in football terms? Like, what opened up that day? Like, what were you guys – like, what happened? Yeah, we, just, we just did the uh... – we kind of did, you know, the, when you play the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens, they play an odd front. So that means the nose is covered, you know, some way, but it, it's covered with the nose guards. So 
when 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 they get in those situations, when Dick LeBeau, he was a defense coordinator, he's kind of the inventor of the, the zone blitz. So when you get them in three, four stuff, you know, they can move the Mike backer and the and the Mo backer, which we used to call it. I call it the Jack now, but the Mike and the Mo, they, they can move those guys around. So you know, they can they can give you so many different looks. So we just decided that week, I remember Bruce saying, you know, we're just going to keep them out of that. We're going to, because when you go to, go to a a regular offense, which is a two-back tight end, two wide receivers, they're going to go to a three-down, three-four look. But if you got into back, a tight end, three wide receivers, then they would go to their nickel defense and they would get in an even front. So an even front, I've, and even front to me is so much because you don't have to – there's something on odd fronts that you have to do where you have to dual read by your guards or you have to figure out some way that you're going to have to protect the outside. You know, some people fan out, some people dual read. So dual read means he reads the backer to the sound backer or the backside guard reads the mode to the wheel. You know, he'll pop out and then the, the tackle stay man on. So when you go into a four down – look then the, the offensive line has the four down guys and then we'll pick a mic out so that's the five guys so we'll declare that and then you know who whichever they declare then the back if it depends on the protection if the back you know if we had a scat protection scat right means he goes left so we have the wheel picked up and then we would be hot off the sam so that's kind of getting a little bit that's what you wanted but that's kind of getting a little bit too detailed but that's Kind of the game plan we went into, we just said, hey, we're going to stay in Kings. We're going to keep them in an even front, and then we're just going to see what happens from there, you know, because we, we thought that we felt like we could we could throw the football on them. Running the ball on the Pittsburgh State was not very good because they, you know, year in, year out, they got the number one, number two rushing defense in the league, them in Baltimore when Ray Lewis and Ed Reed and all those guys were there. They really could stop the run. So we wanted to get them simple and keep them in an even front. So we could know where they were. And then I, I just watched so much film that week that, you know, I told one of my my guys that I know, Kevin Elko, he's a sports psychologist, but I told him, you know, and I'd already played that game in my head the week before because I, I'd watched so much film and I kind of knew what they were going to do. And, you know, and it kind of turned out that way. You know, I knew when they were rolling safeties, I knew, you know, who was going to stay off. And I knew, you know, when to get rid of the ball. I knew where my matchups were. So it, it you know, it kind of, you know, that's what preparation does for you. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the game plan that we had. And, you know, for the last quarter, I mean, we were, you know, there's no, I think we were up 33 to 13 in that game. And I think they scored right before the third quarter ended, which made it 33 to 20. But still with 33 to 20 in that game going in, you know, in the end, end of the fourth quarter, I just, the way we were playing, we should not have lost that football game. And, you know, for whatever reason we did, we started going into that prevent mode, which I can't, I'm just, I'm not a defensive coach, but I know what bothers quarterbacks. And I know what, you know, we had been hitting Tommy Maddox all day, Foj Fozzi, I heard, you know, Lord rest his soul. He had been bringing guys all day. And, you know, we, we had got them out of their offense. We had stayed on the field as an offense. and We were able to do what we wanted to against those guys. And, you know, then, you know, when you get up on, a, on an opponent, you know, people want to play this prevent stuff and say, hey, you know, instead of keep doing what you're doing and with the pedal to the metal. And, you know, that was a, that was a coaching decision that I, I wish we could go back and, you know, not do. But, hey, it turned out that way. Right. So I was going to talk about you guys led for majority of the game. And I have the numbers right here. The Browns led 24 to 7 and also 33 to 21. Um, yeah, okay, 21. There you go. But you guys would lose at the very end after Pittsburgh rallied and Pittsburgh won 33 to 36. And you explained what you think happened. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here. And I understand if you don't want to answer this. But uh, Bruce Arians has gone on record saying Mitch Davis is the reason you guys lost. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, you know, hey, as a head coach, you got a lot of responsibilities, man. And, and um, you know, he, He's the one that, in the final decision, he's the one that makes those calls. You know, I just know that we stopped doing what we were doing, and you know, it's all it's a you know. Here's the deal, and and I just I just re, I just got reconnected with Dennis Northcutt. You know, about two weeks ago. You know, he's living in L.A. and you know, I've got I've got a thread with Andre Davis, Andre Davis, Kevin Bentley, uh, Kevin Johnson, Andre King, all those guys, and then 
you know, asked somebody if they had Northcutt's number because I saw Northcutt on, on the Vice Channel not too long ago, and he was talking about uh, – it was it was a deal about Cleveland, and then he was talking about uh, they had him on there for something else. So I called him and I texted him. Didn't call him, but I texted him, and you know we ca- kind of caught up with each other. But he said, you know, man, he's like me and you are like eternally connected, man, with the way that we played each other, and then eternally connected with the uh, with the Pittsburgh game. And everybody says, well, you know, they always ask me about the play that Northcutt dropped the pass. And, and if Dennis catches that ball, the game's over with. I mean, that's reality. That's the honest truth. But here's what I tell people. If Dennis doesn't make a couple of those punt returns and then he caught two touchdown passes himself that day, you know, we're not in that situation at the end of the game. You know, now, if we could go back and do it all over again, it wouldn't have mattered if they got in that prevent defense, you know, if Dennis catch. But here's the deal. That's football. That's life. I mean, that's, you know, hey, I hate that. And I'm sure that Dennis feels really bad, but I don't. I mean, Dennis was the reason that we were in that position because he made a lot of plays that day. And he was, you know, he, he was one of those guys that was all over the place. He was making plays for us. He caught a couple of touchdown passes for me. You know, he kept driving live. He had a big punt return at one time. So he was the reason that we were in that position. And, you know, unfortunately, if he does make that catch, the game's over anyway. But, you know, that that's – I mean – you know, if my college coach said this, man, he, he, when when we when we met as a senior group our last day, he said, when you listen to Garth Brooks and you listen standing in inside the fire, that was one of his songs. Nobody listens. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people don't know who Garth Brooks is, but you know, that's that's the deal. Like we are standing inside of the fire, man, and, and you can people criticize football players, tennis players, baseball players, basketball, but you're not in the fire. You know, you can criticize from the stands. You can do all that you want to, but, like, you don't know what we go through. We're still human beings. And, you know, unfortunately, Dennis missed that ball. Okay. I mean, that – whatever. I mean, it's it's one of those deals where we played great that day and in the end we came up short. That was the deal because there's other plays in that game that we could have probably made. I could – you know, I, if I wouldn't have thrown that one interception, I forget, I think it was Mike Logan who picked me off. He kind of – he kind of fooled me, but if I don't throw that interception, who knows? We might go down and score again. So, you know, it's just things like that happen, and, and guys are willing to put their names on the line each week and get ridiculed by people on ESPN, on Sports Center, on you know, in the paper. But nobody's really standing in the fire but us, and they don't really know, understand that. Hey. That's part of playing the game, and sometimes you win them, and sometimes you lose them, and sometimes you have bad things happen. Sometimes you have great things happen, but you you can't be an up and down roller coaster. That's just the price of playing the game. Right. So had you guys won that game, how far do you think you could have gotten the playoffs? Because I always point out there was no dynasty that year because the Patriots had not yet become a dynasty. In right. fact, they didn't they didn't even make the playoffs that year. And there was no like really dominant team from what I understand. So like how far do you think you could have gone? Well, I think we were supposed to go play the and you know, here's the deal about the playoffs. You never know. I mean, I thought I think we had a pass Pittsburgh and if we could have gone to Oakland. All you asked was and we were actually we were actually, you know, since I got to, you know, practice that week, I think we were starting to hit like a gear, like, you know, starting to come around and all you can ask for is to get hot during the playoffs. I mean, I used Ben Roethlisberger when he won his first Super Bowl and, and, and uh, against the – I think it was Seattle when he was in Detroit, when it was in Detroit. I mean, I think they ended the season at 9-7, and seven, just like we did. But they he got on they got on a hot streak there at the end. He won a Super Bowl. Right. You know, all you can ask for is a chance. And I, I really felt like, you know, with me getting in there and with having that week of practice and then, you know, getting with those receivers, I, I think we – we're kind of hitting the streak right there where I think that we might have could have done some damage. You don't know, but all you ask for is a chance and you ask, you look for matchups. If we could have gotten by Pittsburgh and gone on to Oakland, I mean, that could have changed, uh, you know, that could have changed lives. I mean, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I, that's all you ask for is a chance to go play another down and another game. And who knows what would have happened. But you're right about the, the New England dynasty. They had not, I think it was the year after that, that they started or, I don't even remember. I mean, years, years start coming together in your brain, but like, you're right. 
you never know what's going to happen and we just needed a chance and unfortunately we weren't able to go on right and uh it, it's kind of realistic you guys could have made a run because had you beat oakland you would have played tennessee and you guys beat tennessee that year so it's, it's it was not that unrealistic yeah, that, that was because we came back kind of on Tennessee. Like, you know, it wasn't as bad as the Chicago Bears deal, but we came back and right. you know, Tim, Tim played really well there in the fourth quarter. And we, we, I think we scored two touchdowns to go ahead of them. So, you know, that was kind of a deal right there where we were down in that game at Tennessee. And I can remember being, you know, because I'm from here. And that was one of the coldest dead young days, man, because they didn't, you know, it was, it wasn't that cold, but like we didn't bring any, you know, big gear because it wasn't supposed to be but when the sun went down man it got really cold but Tim played really well that day Dennis played really well that day he made a he made some huge plays too so you know we were able to you know weather the storm and come back on the Titans that day so yeah yeah you're right I mean there was no real you know team that was there that you knew hey we gotta beat them we just you know just needed a chance and that takes us to the 2003 season. This is where the quarterback controversy probably reached its peak. It was a competition between you and Tim Couch in training camp. You ended up getting the nod. Why do you think you were chosen? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I just I, I think that, I think that Butch just, uh, you know, it's what I could do in the playoff game. And I've, I've been consistent. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Who knows? Um, you know, after that uh, after that playoff game and, you know, we, we let a couple of key guys go, like Dave Wallaba, Sean O'Hara. Uh, I don't know if it was that year, but I think it was. You know, we let, we let some key guys go. I think we needed some – I think we needed a, a, some key ingredients, you know, to kind of take it to the next level, and, and we weren't able to do that. And then – you know, it was kind of pitted. It wasn't the same team, and I mean, that's that's what free agency does nowadays. I mean, you, you get a you get a group of guys that you go to the playoffs with, and I think if we could have kept those guys together and uh, just added some pieces offensively and defensively, I think we could have been doing that for a while. And you know, for whatever reason, you know, people saw it differently and and wanted to you know make some changes and. You know, each year, you know, you don't have what happened with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this year where they keep every free agency. That's never happened. And, uh, you know, we lost some key guys, and we lost some key key guys that were leaders that kind of kind of built the camaraderie of, amongst us. And, you know, it just was not the same team. Yeah, in Brown's lore, that's called the salary cap purge, I remember. Um you did an interview with Jim Donovan a couple months ago, or I guess it's been longer than that now, but yeah, yeah. some of those players wanted to stay and they would have less money. Well, that's what I told you earlier. I mean, that's, that's, that was the whole thing that was baffling to me because we had a, we had a really, we had a good group of guys. I mean, we, you know, Corey Fuller and all those guys, Robert Griffith, we had a, you know, Quincy and, and we had a good group of dudes. We had a good group of guys that, you know, we're, it, it seemed like we were turning the corner. I mean, it seemed like we were, hey, we just need a couple of key pieces. And I thought we could have – I thought we could have done that for three or four years because, you know, after talking to some of the guys that, you know, you become friends with, I mean, because you're – you know, you sweat and you, you go through the offseason – after you go through the offseason program with those guys. But after, you know, talking to some of those guys, they wanted to stay. Because they thought, just like I'm saying right now, they thought we had a really good opportunity to have something good going, and they would have taken less money. Because I just said, like, there's no other place. I, I went to other other places, and and you know, there's there's not a lot of teams. I'm sure it's different now, uh, but there's not a lot of teams that took care of you like the Cleveland Browns took care of you. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody knows that, but like, you know, they just treated their players really good. And, you know, that, that was kind of it, – it became, you know, free agency is just recruiting for college. That's all it is. And, and when people come in and see that, you know, that's how you get Dwayne Road. That's how you got myself. That's how you get other key free agents to come in there because they like, you know, what's going on. They like the way they take care of their players. They're going to take care of guys. 
you know, we had a person, you know, we had a player liaison guy that like all you needed, that all they wanted us to do was play football. So if you needed, you know, something for your parents, uh, if you needed a hotel room for them or that, all you had to do was go talk to my man, Jad, and, you know, he got all that stuff hooked up. So everybody wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to stay. And they all told me, just like you just told me, that they were taking less money to have stayed. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what was done there, but I just felt like that we were kind of at that point where – we could have taken off and for whatever reason, the people that were in the key positions in the front office did not see it that way. Yeah. It's very strange because the only explanation would be they're trying to tank, but they just made the playoffs. So why would you be tanking? It's just baffling. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'll be honest with you. I really don't. I, I don't. And I wish we could have, I wish you could have gone back and you could have, you know, you, you could reset that and done that all over again. Cause I, I just think that, you know, that's a deal right there where, hey, you never know what's going to happen, but if we could have taken it to the next level and got another key, you know, just, just added a couple of guys. Right. Just added a couple of guys. You never know what's going to happen. And I, I think that, you know, you, we could have done that for three or four or five years. You know, if you could have just added some key players and, and kept some key free agents and not got rid of them. Because Dave Wallabaugh went to uh, St. Louis and won a Super Bowl. Sean O'Hara went to New York and won a Super Bowl. You know, you look at those guys. I mean, Bruce went to Pittsburgh and won two Super Bowls. Uh, Coach Smith, which was my quarterback coach, went to Seattle and won a Super Bowl. You know, th there was there was key things there that, you know, they you know those guys go on and they do bigger and better things. And we had them, and they wanted to stay. Yeah, just – it was just, it was, it was tough. To, it, it really was, man. You're looking back on it. I, I don't try to harp on it anymore because, you know, people that make those decisions, they, you know, they make those decisions for whatever reason, but, you know, I don't, I don't try to, I don't, I don't try to dwell on that anymore. I just look back. I, I think that we could have been really good and that could have been a deal where we could have been really consistent for a lot of years. And, and instead of having, you know, all those coaches that have come and gone and gotten fired and we could have been consistent for a while. And, it's, you know, you could have started something like the Pittsburgh Steelers have had for 40 years uh, with all the Super Bowls that they've won and, and the Super Bowls that they won with Chuck Noah and then they won, you know, the one with Cowher. And then, you know, they, have they won two with Tomlin? Two with Tomlin? No, I think they only won one. Have they? Okay. But, I mean, still, it's just uh, – you know, I think that I think that we could have had some consistency there, man. And, and you know, I, I don't think that the, I don't think that the Browns would have been, you know, in lackadaisical for more than a decade. I, I really don't. I, I, I just I just baffles my mind. It really bothers me because that's where people remember me from, and you know, that's that's where people remember Tim from. And you know, it's just uh, it's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate. But I, I like I'm dwelling on it right now. But I don't really dwell on that. After, you know, just just talking to you. I mean, I'm I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing this interview and trying to rehash all this stuff. And it's you know, I I told myself I wouldn't do that. But you know, it was uh, I, I think there was it was an opportunity for us to be really good for many years. And 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 I don't think the Browns instead of taking that nose dive that they took, I think it could have been a an upward ascension, you know, and, and if we could have just kept guys together that wanted to stay and just added some pieces, man, I think we could have been really good for a while. Right. So um, to continue to talk about 2003, you got injured in week three against San Francisco. And after that, it was back and forth between you and Tim Couch. Browns finished five and 11. Um, I was going to ask you what went wrong. We kind of talked about that and salary cap purge and all that. Um. There's two it's, it's, it just comes back to consistency, man. That's what happened. Right. So there's two games from 2003 I kind of want to talk to you about. The first one is the New England game. I don't know if you remember that. It was 9-3. to three. Yeah, I don't remember much about it. Was it in Foxborough, I think? Yeah, it was, in, it was in Foxborough. I only asked you about it because they wanted to go win the Super Bowl that year. They were 14-2. and two. And it was just a, kind of a weird 9-3. I just It always kind of stuck out to me. Yeah, I can remember being uh, – I think – I think. Um, man, I'm trying to remember, uh, Rob. I'm, I'm thinking that 
I think I, I think I broke my ribs in the Cincinnati game. I think that was the game. Was that the game? I don't uh, remember, man. I don't I remember. remember. I did. I, yeah, I don't. I don't remember that. I, I remember it being nine to three, and I, I don't remember much about the game. I really don't. You, you're, you start getting into detailed games about that stuff, and I don't remember much. No, that's really the problem. It. I just. We, we had a, we had a, I mean, like the year we went to the playoffs, man, we had a really good team, a really good defense, you know? So that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's just, it's just frustrating to rehash these emotions from back then, man, because. I feel bad now. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's just, if we just could have held things together, we were there, we were there. We were, you know, we were reaching the point of being consistent year in and year out. And it just, just got blew up for some reason. I don't know. And the other game, this one you probably would remember because uh, it was the Arizona game. You guys won forty-four to six, right? It was that, that remains the most lopsided victory the Browns have had since '99. So that's just another game where you're just in the zone. Like, talk about that if you remember anything. Yeah, I do remember that game. I, I um, yeah, it was just one of those deals where you just. I mean, I was I was fortunate enough to be in a bunch of those games, man. Where I. You know, even even when I went on to play with the Buffalo Bills, I, I had a I had a game, and and even when and even when I think I don't know if it was a Cincinnati game. I remember one of the Cincinnati games where I threw for over 400 yards too. Um, I think I had I think I threw for five touchdowns, but it's just one of those deals where you just get into a situation where you just you're just playing ball in the backyard with your buddies. I mean, that's just, you, you know what's going on. You know what the defense is doing to you. You know the offense in and out. You just understand what's happening. And that was one of those deals. That was another one of those deals against Arizona where, you know, I think I threw a, a long pass to to, uh, to Quincy for a touchdown. I, I just, I had, a, I had a really bunch of those games. Right. So after 2003, Bruce Arians is fired as offensive coordinator. Was that kind of like out of left field? What was your reaction to that? Well, I mean, you understand how the game works, man. I mean, we all understand how the game works nowadays. And, you know, when, when he gets on coaches, man, they got to make decisions. And, you know, for whatever reason, coach, you know, whatever reason, Butch decided to go in a different direction. Uh, I didn't agree with it. You know, and I think that, you know, it's obviously – shown now that, it, uh, you know, he felt like it was the right decision. Obviously, it wasn't, I didn't think it was the right decision. And, and Bruce, just, he, just won, he just won a Super Bowl. I mean, he, he went out to Arizona and won at Arizona, you know. So, um, you know, and when he was when, – when Chuck Bugano, who I knew Chuck from Cleveland, when Chuck Bugano got sick, you know, Bruce took over the Colts and, you know, won there. That's how he got the head coach job at Arizona. And that's how the Arizona job became the, the Tampa Bay job. So, you know, Bruce is a really good football coach. And did I agree with it? No, because Bruce is one of my guys, man. I love Bruce. And, you know, he's, um, you know, he was kind of the guy that, it, you know, he etched me along. He brought me with him. Uh, he, you know, he, he always says now, I mean, I was, he even wrote a book and put a chapter in there in his book about me and just talking about how I myself reminded him of himself because of, you know, nobody ever gave us a chance and we worked hard and we were good enough to make it. And, you know, Bruce kind of saw, saw himself in me. But, no, I did not agree with what happened with Bruce. I, I did not agree with that. Uh, you know, and Bruce was my guy. And he brought me with him, and I was a little upset about that. But, you know, in the end, what can you do? There's nothing you can do, and that's what the, that's what the uh, decision. Somebody, somebody when, when he gets on somebody, somebody's got to take the – Somebody's got to be the downfall. And, you know, unless the coach is going to say, you know, I'm not doing that. If you're going to get rid of him, then you're going to get rid of me. And there's not too many guys are going to do that. So somebody's got to take the fall. And, you know, that, that's kind of what happened. All right, so moving on to 2004 here, which is your last year with the Browns, Tim Couch departed in the offseason and Jeff Garcia was brought in from San Francisco. Uh, was it always clear Jeff was going to be the starter? I mean, when they pay him the money like they paid him, yeah. I mean, that's just yeah. – you, know, you can see the writing on the wall. I mean, and, and plus I had – you know, and, and I can kind of understand why they did that, but I I, I'd, I had torn my labrum in the offseason. Uh, I didn't realize what it was. I think I'd done it, uh, I'd done it during the season, but I tore my labrum and I had to have surgery. So, 
you know, you can't go into the, uh, you, you know, and I, I don't know what Butch was thinking. I don't know what the front office was thinking. They were, they obviously were going to get somebody anyway, but you know, you can't go into it with the quarterback who's got a torn labrum, who's not going to be in any mini camps or whatever. So I had to, you know, I was there for training camp, but you know, when you pay the guy the kind of money that you pay him, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way that league works. That's the way any professional sports work. I mean, there's no, sometimes it's not a fair deal. And, you know, if he's getting paid all that money, then he's going, he's going to get paid all that. Yeah, you froze up. Um, oh, I froze up? Yeah, I couldn't see anything. I can go well, now. I can see you. You froze up on me, so we froze together. <laughs> um, we were talking about Jeff Garcia. So there was no competition. He was because he. Yeah, did I mean, I mean that's that's kind of the way. That's that's the way. That, that's what professional sports go. When you get, give a guy all that kind of money, I mean, there's. Right. I mean, do do I feel, do I feel superior in my abilities to win a job? Because here's the deal. Now, when I came in, the way I came in, I'd learned to fight for everything that I got. I'd learned to, you know, I, I, I'm always, I've always been a competitor. That's one of my, that's one of the traits that that uh, got me to where I was. I compete at everything. I mean, I compete with my kids at Candyland when I was a kid. So, uh, I, I'm a competitor, and uh, you know, that was kind of a that was a deal, you know, that was kind of a, yeah, I don't know if it was a slap in the face, but you know what's happening. I mean, that, they're going to give that guy all that kind of money, but, you know, given my abilities and given my competitiveness and my confidence in myself, I, I wish I would have had an opportunity. I mean, I ended up playing that year anyway, because I think he got hurt, but, you know, I just, I, I wish I would have, I wish I would have been healthy enough. You know, we talked about that health issue a couple of segments ago, but, I wish I would have been healthy enough where I could have been there, the mini camps and all that, where I could have competed with him. But, you know, when you get paid that kind of money, you know, you, you know where the scale weighs and, you know, it, it's going towards him anyway. So that was, you know, that was just, that's, that's that business. Right. So 2004 actually started pretty decent. The Browns were three and three. It looked interesting, but then the wheels completely came off and the Browns were on a nine game losing streak. But in between all of that was the famous shootout down in Cincinnati, and you touched on that earlier. Right. Um, threw for five touchdowns and scored 48 points, but unfortunately was in a losing effort. It's one of the few times you score oh, yeah. and lose. Um, what are your memory? I mean, I guess you already talked about it, but is it fair to say that's like your second most memorable game behind the playoff game? Uh. Well, I mean, here's, here's another thing, too. When I go down with Buff I go down with the Buffalo Bills, and I think I have another – I don't know if it was a 400-yard game, but, I mean, I had another game against Cincinnati where we ended up – Cincinnati was really good that year in Buffalo. We, you know, we were kind of – we weren't very good. And we go down there, and, you know, I torched them again. We ended up, we ended up winning that game. But uh, I do remember that game. I mean, I, I can remember, you know, the, the Arizona game like you talked about. So – that's 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 why I say I had such such memorable games with like throwing for all these yards and all these touchdowns and things like that and then you know I don't want to rehash it but you just I just couldn't stay healthy man I mean I got I ended up getting uh, I ended up getting hurt in that game uh, that that's that's the game right there where I broke my ribs right. uh, yeah I, I, Justin Smith hit me on the sideline I broke my ribs it was really it was up top and. Um, I broke some ribs in that game and finished finished that game, but that that was you know uh, that was kind of a shootout with Carson Palmer. I saw Carson when we I went out to Arizona and saw Bruce and those guys, and I talked to Carson and, and we 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 ended up talking about that game and rehashing that game. But um, you know, it's just one of those deals where we just I mean it was it was bad that year. Uh, that was the year that Butch you know resigned during the year and you know Robisky took over and and. Uh, you know, from where we came from a couple of years before to that, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's just we had the team going in the right direction. And then we go to that where Butch resigns. We get an interim head coach. I mean, it's just it was a it was a cesspool at that time. And then, you know, they never recovered until they never recovered until, you know, uh, I think they had a I think they had one good year with the. Uh, was the Anderson Anderson guy? Was he the quarterback? I think yeah, they had. Anderson. They had a, yeah, uh, I think they had a winning year that year, but I don't think they made the playoffs. But then you know it hadn't really been anything since Baker got there. 
you know, so that's been a long drought of just, I don't know what's going on in Cleveland. And, and the fans don't deserve that. They really don't. They're such good fans. They really, you know, in the state of Ohio, they, you know, I know the Bengals are there, but it's just they, they, everybody loves the Browns. I mean, there's so many Browns backers across the country, and I, I, I just – everybody loves the Browns. I went to one in Franklin, and I watched the game with them. I, I was just going to go there for a little bit. You know, I've got a friend that asked me to go, and I was going to go there a little bit, and I ended up watching the whole dead game game there, and it was last year when they played the Jets, and they ended up getting beat by the Jets. I said, y'all won't want me to show up anymore. I'm, I'm bad luck, but – uh, there's just so much support, man, and and that's it's just. Um, I mean, we were on the right track. We were on yeah, the right like, track, and we just kind of like a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to like bring up bad uh, all these bad memories. I was just curious about. Well, I mean, that's part of the that's part of the history of the Browns, man. I mean, it's just it yeah. is what it is. I, that's that's where everything went wrong. I mean, it is what it is. So. You brought this up. That Bengals game turned out to be Butch Davis's last game. He resigned the day after. Was that a like totally out of nowhere? Or did you guys see that coming? Uh, we kind of felt it. You kind of felt it was coming. And did he address the team before he left? I just remember, uh, Rob, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, you got me now better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me hook this thing up, man. I'm sorry. No problem. It just, can you hear me? Am I good now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, I know. I don't know. We lost connection there, but I was asking about Butch Davis when he resigned. You said he did address the team. Yeah, no, he did address the team. Yes, he he did address the team, and you know he was. Uh, let me get this thing set up. Uh, yeah, he addressed the team. He, uh, you know, he was. I mean, he was upset, which I can understand. I mean, he just, you know, I'm sure he put all of it, you know, he put his life in there and, you know, he, he was in the fire like I was talking about. And he just, uh, it was one of those deals where, you know, he just addressed us and said that he thought it was better that, you know, he resigned and it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough because, because, you know, when you come in as a head coach, and, you know, he had been at Miami, you know, I was watching the U on, on ESPN today. 30 for 30 and you know he comes from winning the national championship and you know he's got so many expectations and high expectations he wants to try it because he had won the, he'd been with the Dallas Cowboys and he was a defensive coordinator and D-line coach and you know he had a lot of success and you know to come there and then you know be in charge of everything and just didn't have the success that he wanted and you know that we wanted I mean that's you know that's a uh, that's a, that's a tough deal, and you know um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it was just uh, you know he he was upset, but you know he here's the, here's the deal. What I felt about that, and I've talked to Coach Coach Davis. I mean, I I've, I, uh, I saw him up here because he's at FIU and they play MTSU up here. So I, I saw him a couple of years ago, and I've uh, been trying to get him to look at my son, which, you know, hopefully he does. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any hard feelings. I, I think I did at the time. I had some hard feelings, but I, I don't have any hard feelings. I mean, it is what it is. And he did what he thought was best. Uh, it just didn't work out. Uh, I, I just – I was upset because, I mean, he got to leave. We had to stay in it. Right. You know, and that's – you know, I, I – I don't know. I'm sure he, he I'm sure he's probably, I, I don't know if he's going to get fired anyway. He's probably going to get fired anyway. I just, I just, that's the hard part, I think, for guys. That, that's the hard part. You know, you get cut, but you don't just, you know, you don't just quit. And, you know, sometimes that, that fire gets a little hot. And, uh, you know, he, he decided to do that. And I was, you know, we, we all had to stay in it. And it wasn't very fun. You know, it wasn't very fun because we were not very good. Right. Um, so one last thing on 2004, you started the last game down in Houston and the Browns won snapping that nine game losing streak. Uh, do you remember that game by any chance? Uh, I don't remember much about it. I, I, uh, I remember that, that, you know, they, they were, they had, a. I mean, they, they started to have a really good season. I mean, I think that they, if they, 
if they won that game, I think they would have been 500. I think they'd have been eight and eight. If I'm yeah, not that's mistaken. right. Yeah. Yeah. So they had everything to play for, and we had nothing to play for. And, you know, guys were just playing to, you know, maybe if you're a free agent, get an opportunity to go somewhere else or, you know, get paid some more money or, you know, and that's the unfortunate thing, man, in that business and in professional sports. I mean, when you start off and you got a chance to go win a championship, then guys buy in. But people say, well, you know, you're doing it for the money. Well, you know, even when you're getting paid a lot of money, I mean, if you don't have a chance and have a chance to win things, that's a, that's a tough deal. And, and that's what make, made that victory so cool because we, we weren't going anywhere. We just lost our head coach weeks later, weeks earlier. Um, you know, guys went out there and fought. And, uh, you know, you get some teams that'll do that. Some teams has got good character and, and we fought. We had nothing to play for, but, you know, everything we had was to ruin, you know, the, the Houston, uh, the Houston Texans, you know, 500 season. Cause I think they'd been really bad because they're an expansion team, obviously. And they'd been really bad and, they had a chance to be eight and eight, and we made them seven to nine, which felt pretty good. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that's the last time the Browns won down in Houston. So was it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, but almost positive. Um, real quickly about that season again. After you got hurt in Cincinnati, Luke McCown took over. Right. And those were no, no disrespect to him, but those are some pretty dark times. Like, do you remember kind of consoling him and trying to like mentor him? Uh well, I mean, yeah, I mean, just just mentoring kids, man. I mean, he's a, he's a young guy, and he didn't, you know. I think he went to. What, did he go to Louisiana Tech? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, and of course, his brother Josh has come in and made a huge career for himself. Yeah. I mean, he's played for a while, but you know, Luke was a very athletic kid. I mean, he was athletic, but just for some reason, man, things hadn't worked out. Even you know, I I, I don't know. Yeah, those were uh, you know, he had some ability. He did, have, he did have some ability, but when you come into the league and, you know, you're playing with a bad team like that and, and you don't have much success at the beginning of your career, it has it kind of it can have an effect on you. And I, I, I kind of think that's what happened to Luke. I don't know if that's the case, but, you know, you do as much as you can to help a young guy. I mean, I really liked Luke. I thought he I, – I really liked him. He was a good kid. I enjoyed him. I, I actually met him at uh, – I think I met him at Peyton's camp because um, Peyton – brings all the young quarterbacks and I think I met him at Peyton's camp and then he ended up coming to the Browns, which was, uh, which was a cool deal. I, I actually met uh, him there and I met, uh, gosh, I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, uh, move on, man. CT. <laughs> I'll move uh -huh. on. But yeah. Yeah. I, you, you try to console a guy like that, but we weren't very good, man. I mean, there's not much you can do. You just go out and do the best you can and, you know, try to know your opponent as much as you can and do what you can. And, you know, that was a tough situation to be put in as a rookie quarterback. And, and you know, I, I wish I could have helped him some more. I, I You know, when you get broke ribs, man, that, you know, especially up, up towards your up towards your chest, man, that really hurt. You know, they, I don't know if you've ever had them, but you just don't want to get hit in them again. I, I could have probably taken some shots and played, but I just didn't want to do that. We weren't going anywhere. And, you know, that was uh, that was not a good time in Brown's lore, that's for sure. Right. And that was it for your time in Cleveland. You departed in the offseason. What led to you leaving? Was that your own choice or the new regime? No, I could have stayed at Cleveland. I mean, I talked to uh, Romeo Cornell, uh, but I'd already had something in the works. I'd been with Mike Malarkey and Sam Weitz, I told you earlier. I've been with those guys in, uh, uh, in uh, Tampa Bay. And uh, Mike was offensive coordinator at Pittsburgh when I had that, you know, the game in the playoff game. So he had always liked me and he kind of wanted to bring me along if he, you know, and, and he became a head coach. So, you know, they kind of came after me. And I don't think the, the Browns knew anything about that. I don't think that they knew that they had, I had that in the, in the wings. And, you know, I just thought that uh, I, I'd already heard that they were trying to get Trent, which Trent Dilfer, I played with him in Tampa. And Trent's actually, I've actually hooked up with Trent. He's, He's coaching a high school here in Nashville. His daughter goes to Lipscomb Academy, and my daughter goes to Lipscomb Academy, or not at Lipscomb Academy, but Lipscomb University. And my daughter plays basketball, and his daughter plays volleyball. So he coaches the academy there that's uh, that's connected to the to the college. And uh, I had heard that they were going to bring Trent in, and uh, you know it was a new regime. I didn't really care anything about starting over. 
you know, I could have stayed there, but uh, I just decided to go on with Mike and those guys in Buffalo. And, you know, I enjoyed my time in Buffalo as well. All right. So one last thing on the Browns. What's a what's like an interesting or funny story about the Butch Davis years that people aren't aware of? It doesn't have to be about you specifically, just like about the team, like any, any player, right, really? Uh, probably, there's probably stuff you can't say, but. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there's some things, but I, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, let me think of, let me think of what it, I forgot what, I forgot what Bobby used to put in the donuts. He, he, he get, he bring, they bring Krispy Kremes in it every day. And uh, not every day, but on on uh, on Saturday, Saturday mornings, they would have the Rich's Brand Krispy Kreme donuts. And there was a couple of times where Bobby Monica, which I still talk to Bobby, but Bobby was our equipment manager. And they were supposed to be, uh, they were supposed to be cream donuts. And he put other things in the cream donuts and we would just laugh, man. It was, it was, it was pretty good. I mean, other than the times that, you know, Ty Denver was there, he wasn't there very long for, with me, but he was, he was notorious about, when you go into the bathroom and you're into the, you're in the john, he he, there's no question that he'd go pour some water on you. He'd dump, he'd bring a whole cooler and dump water on you. I mean, you know, Denver was uh, Ty was a clown. He was uh, he was a good guy though. So that you know, just just moments like that that you remember in your life. I mean, that's just the relationships. That's the things you remember about football. Just you know, you you love playing games, but like through the week, you know, practicing stunk. I I, I you know nobody. I was a quarterback and I didn't like practice, but you know, it's one of those necessary things, but those are the things you miss. I wish I could go down. And, you know, that's what I tell the young kids that I coach now. I wish I could go back and practice right now. I mean, I, I would love to go back with some of my former teammates and practice and watch film and work out. And, you know, when you're a young kid, when you're 21, 22, 23, 24 years old, you just you, you don't think that stuff's ever going to end, which you know it's going to back in the back of your mind. But when you're in it, you don't think it's going to happen. and you know, I talked to Alvin McKinley last week. I talked to Aaron Shea, Aaron Shea last week. I, you know, there's, you know, I'm still keeping touch with Mark Campbell. Uh, just things like that, man. You just uh, you miss. I mean, I miss that. Right. Um, so, touching base on the remainder of your NFL career, you played with the Bills, Eagles, and Vikings. Talk about your time with those teams. Um. Uh, I mean, the Bills, I, I, I wish, you know, it was kind of another situation where, you know, they had another guy with J.P. lost, but J.P. was a good talent. He was a talented guy. But, you know, for whatever reason, Mike Mike ended up leaving. I ended up starting for the last eight games of that year, but Mike Mike Malarkey, for whatever reason, he ended up leaving. I don't know why. I, mean, I, I think that – I mean, the same thing happened with him at the Titans down here. I, I think Mike is a loyal guy, and I think Mike is uh, – I think when people come to him and try to say, hey, you know, you need to get rid of this guy, you need to get rid of that guy, I, I don't know that for sure, but I think that's kind of what he does. But I think he says, no, those are my guys, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, you know, I think that's what happened to him in Buffalo. I'm not totally for sure on that. I'm just hypothetically thinking that's my opinion. I wish Mike could have stayed in Buffalo because I might have could have been able to stay in Buffalo for longer. But he stayed there for one year while I was there and then, Dick Jerron came in, and Dick was a good good guy, but we had uh, Steve Fairchild was the offensive coordinator. And, you know, there's guys that you mix with and guys you don't. And uh, there's, you know, there's coaches that like you and there's coaches that you don't, that, that don't like you. So it was one of those deals. I just didn't feel comfortable in that offense. It wasn't – I'd, I'd been in Bruce's offense and Tom Moore's offense for, what, four, seven years. You know, and I, you get comfortable with that and you get kind of long in the tooth and you, you – you're, you're a pro guy for so long and then somebody comes along and they introduce you to a new way of doing things with what you've done and it's just different and you know you kind of make your you kind of make your judgments on that and then you, you get set in your mind well I really don't like that you know and, and uh, I didn't play very well I, I just wasn't confident in it uh, in the offense and I just you know it was my fault you know, it was my fault, but I, I just wish that Mike Malarkey could have stayed there as coach because I think I, I could have could have stayed there for a while. And then I get, you know, then I get traded. They trade me, uh, me and Takeo Spikes. I was traded with Takeo. And uh, um, we went to Philadelphia and, you know, um, they, ended up, they ended up drafting Kevin Cobb. You know, they, had, they already had A.J. Feely and they had um, – 
uh, gosh, Donovan McNabb to be the, you know, he was a starting quarterback. So, you know, they already had two guys and then Kevin Cobb, they, they, they didn't think they were going to get him. They ended up drafting him. So I'm like, I didn't, I didn't realize why they, you know, they traded for me. They traded for me before the draft. And, you know, I went up there and I learned the offense. It was a West Coast deal. I, you know, I enjoyed being around Andy Reid and Pat Shermer and those guys. And then one of my good friends who's not far from here, he's, he's, uh, he's the new head coach for the Texans, David Kelly. He was, he grew up not far from here. And I, you know, I became really close with him and, and uh, went up to Philly and, you know, they ended up trading me to Minnesota and that was, Adrian Peterson's first year and you know um Brad Childress was the head coach and you know there's coaches that like you and there's coaches that don't like you you know so that's where I'm gonna go with that one (laughs) uh were you in Philadelphia with Jeff Garcia uh I was not no he was not there he was uh he had already come through there AJ Peter was AJ Peter was the backup and then you know Kevin ended up Ended up being the third string guy that year, and then he ended up becoming the starter for, I guess, when Donovan left, or I think when he went to Washington, Kevin Kevin became the starter. And I don't know. I think he got hurt, but you know, Kevin had some talent too. But you know, it didn't it didn't work out. But uh, I enjoyed my time with Andy Reid. I enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, I liked him and and uh, Rick Burkholder, which was the um, which which is still is his guy out there in, in Kansas City right now. He's a trainer, so I, I I ended up getting to know those guys and wasn't around them very long. But I like those guys. I really do, and I can understand. I, I was really poor Andrew Reid getting, you know, winning that Super Bowl. Yeah, and you officially retired in two thousand eight, correct? I did, yes. And wrapping up a thirteen year NFL career, so not too shabby. Are you happy with your career looking back? Uh. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm happy that, that, you know, I was able to outlast what normal normal guys go in. I mean, I think the average lifespan of an NFL player is 3.3 years. So that's uh, that's not too long, and I was able to way outlast that. I, I You know, I wish, you know, and I've said it, I've rehashed it over and over, but I wish I could have stayed healthy. You know, when I did get my opportunities to play, I think I could have played at a high level. Uh, but I just, you know, couldn't stay healthy. It wasn't the right situation. Uh, a lot of times and you know there's times that you know I felt really I felt really confident you know and and players have to have they have to have a feeling that the coach has confidence in them and you have to give that coaches you have to give that confidence to the coaches and I felt like when I was with Tom and when I was with Bruce I mean I really flourished I felt like when I was with Bruce I really flourished and then you know, you go to Buffalo and then Mike Malarkey really believes in you. And, and you know, he, he would ask me things that I wanted to run that he didn't have in the offense, which, you know, makes you feel good because you, you can feel comfortable because that's what people, you know, that's how you can get good. You know, and that's how you have a good working relationship with a coach when he knows that you don't like everything he calls. He wants to know that's what Bruce used to always do. He's like, I want to know your plays that you like and the ones that you don't like. If you don't like these, then why am I going to call them? Because you don't feel good about them. And um, I think that's what really makes and, – and, you know, when I'm, you know, talking about Buffalo and Dick Duran and those guys came there, I just didn't feel conf- confident in the offense. I just – you know, it was that St. Louis offense with uh, – uh, it was the St. Louis offense with Kurt Warner and all those guys where we took seven-step drops. He got hit quite a bit, but like he had Isaac Bruce and he had, you know, Torrey Holt. He had uh, – you know, and Marshall Falk, which I played with Marshall Falk in Indianapolis, and still, you know, he, he and Adrian Peterson were the two best running backs I ever played with. But Marshall, you know, he he could he was like a receiver. He was so smart. He was like a quarterback. You know, he had those guys behind him. I just didn't feel confident in that type of offense. I had never run that stuff. And it, it was my own fault. I mean, it was my own fault because I, I just – I didn't feel confident in it. I didn't play well. I just – just uh, I kind of lost my confidence there. And then – you know, I was able to go to Minnesota and, you know, I played a couple of games there with the West Coast stuff. And I, I wasn't very, I wasn't very, uh, I wasn't very versed in that offense either. You know, I learned it and I liked it better than the, you know, I liked it better than the Mark stuff. But, you know, it was one of those deals where just, just, you know, the stuff that Peyton ran forever with Tom Moore and those guys. And, and I got used to with Bruce. That was, that was what I was used to. And I wish I could have stayed with it. Mm-hmm. So getting close to the end here, what are your thoughts on the current Browns team? I think they're really good, man. 
Uh, I, I think that uh, Baker made he's obviously Baker Mayfield is obviously taking the, the Browns to the playoffs once. I mean, he's got a really good team around him. He's got some guys that can make plays. Uh, I you know I, I think they're I think they're where our team was when I talked about where we could we could have taken off. I think they're that way. I mean. You know, obviously Baker's got to play. He's got to play good football. I mean, that's what's expected in the National Football League. That the starting quarterback has to play good football, and you got to distribute the ball around, and you got to make plays. You can't turn the ball over, and you know you got to make things happen. And I think he's showed that he can do that. So, I, you know, I, I think their defense is. You know, I think their defense is young, and they're. You know, I think they got a chance to to win some games. I think that I think they're. Hopefully they're on the up and up. That's that's what I, I want for them. I mean, that's where people remember me from, and I'm kind of connected with the Browns, and that's my team. And you know, I want them to do really good, and I think they got an opportunity to be successful for two or three or four years. Especially when, you know, with, with the way free agency is, man, you can be bad one year, and the next year you can get some key free agents, and you can, you know, you can go all the way to the Super Bowl, then you can lose some key free agents too. So you never know how it's going to be. Uh, year in and year out, you know, that, like there's there's only one team in the history that's ever kept all the free agents, and that's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this past year. So we'll see how it goes, but I think they've got a lot of key key young players that are pretty good. Yeah, and, and all the hype seems real this time because I remember heading into 2019, there was just as much hype, but obviously they didn't live up to those expectations. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really think uh, – I know everybody's talking, you know, that everybody was talking about in 2019, they got a shot to go. So I'm like, I, I don't really, I think you're going to have to give them a little bit more time. Right. And, and I think it turned out, it obviously turned out that way, you know. So uh, they're probably going to have to have a little bit more time, learn how to win those games, those, you know, get, gain some experience in those big games. But I think they got the ability to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so before we end this, I want to do some rapid fire questions, if that's all right. Oh, Lord, I can't remember anything, Rob. Come on now. <laughs> right. uh, favorite Browns teammate? Uh, man, there's so many. I mean, you know, Tim. Tim's – I still talk to Tim, Aaron Shea, Alvin McKinley. Yeah, that's um, too many. You know, Andre King, Andre Davis, Andre Davis. I got to see them. Phil Dawson is – Phil Dawson's down here with Trent Dilfer, too. Phil, Phil moved to Nashville with his family. So he's coaching with him. He's a special teams coordinator. Phil Dawson is one of my really good friends. Mark Campbell. Uh, uh, I hadn't talked to Chris Gardock in a while. I think my wife's – I think my wife – I don't know if she still keeps in touch with Sally. But, uh, you know, that's what you miss, man. You miss you miss the relationships you have with those guys. q Dog, Q Quincy Morgan, I still – you know, he's in one of these uh, – he's in one of our text, text – our group text things. So – you know, Kevin Bentley, I mean, we still talk. Kevin, you know, Kevin Johnson's in it too. Uh, of course, I don't I don't have his number in there. I just think it pops up as a number. I don't have his name, but you know, just uh just getting to uh just getting to catch up. I, I, I stay in touch really with uh I stay in touch with Alvin. I talk to Aaron Shea a bunch, but I stay in touch with Andre King probably more than I do anybody. Uh favorite NFL head coach. Favorite NFL head coach, man. That's uh, that's a that's a tough one. I mean, I I uh, and, and this guy's passed away, man. But I I, I really enjoyed Lindy, Lindy and Fonny. I, I thought that he was a. I thought he cared about you know. He me and my wife was in Indianapolis, and this is when I was trying to make the team, man. But he, he saw me and my wife out one night. We were at Red Lobster in Indianapolis, and him and his wife were there, and he paid for my my meal, and. Uh, I didn't get get to really know him. I mean, I like Mike Malarkey. I like Sam, man. I like Sam White so much. I really did. Uh, you know, I know this is giving you all of them. But, you know, Jim Moore was kind of a stickler for things. But, I, you know, I really like Lindy. I, I think that he uh, he was more of a coordinator type, man. He, he, he had such a big heart. I mean, I think when you get, uh, when you get to that level, man, you kind of, you know, you have to have relationships with players to bring the best out of them. But I, I think a lot of head coaches may kind of step aside because at the end, they're probably going to have to, you know, at some point, you know, it's not going to end well. Even even with some of the high-profile profile, profile guys, it's not going to end well. 
you know, you're going to have to let them go. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of head coaches get guarded at that, you know, but uh, I, I really enjoyed Lindy and I wasn't with him, but for a year. And I really liked him because I thought he had a, I thought he had a heart of gold, man. I really did. Um, hardest hit you ever took? Hardest hit I ever took was when I was in college. There was a guy that uh, in, in, in uh, at Georgia Southern, I got picked up and slammed and I shattered my jaw in the first series of the third quarter. And that, that was another stupid game. I finished, I ended up finishing that game with a shattered jaw. I had to get it repaired when I got back here in the Murfreesboro, but I forget the guy's name. I think his last name was Johnson. He was a defensive lineman from Georgia Southern. And uh, I think it was 19, ooh, I think it was 1992 or 93. And that was the hardest hit I've ever took. I mean, that's, you know, now I will say that uh, Jared Allen went in the pros uh, when I played for Buffalo. We played the Kansas City Chiefs when he was with Kansas City. And he picked me up and he slammed me. And uh, I can remember it right now, <laughs> those lights sounding – I remember it sounded like I had a million bees in my head and those lights, those lights of, uh, of Bill Stadium uh, getting dimmer and dimmer and me going to sleep. So that, that, was, a, that was a pretty rough hit. Shit. Uh, do you have any game day traditions or superstitions, anything like that? Uh, I don't know if I have any superstitions. I, I just my game day for tradition was to, just to get over there early. I got, I got, you know, myself and Peyton used to walk over there like four hours before the game. Uh, Tim used to get over there early before the game. I used to get over there early. I was there for probably four hours before the game, just sitting around reading the program. We'd go out and, you know, we'd go out and throw and get dressed, you know, just get dressed and go out and throw. And, you know, that was kind of my pregame ritual, but I don't know if it was a, superstition i just you know i just like to uh, i like to get over there early and just start thinking about things uh favorite nfl player ever uh favorite nfl player ever um i will say this when i was growing up as a kid uh you know of course we don't you know every, every everybody there's so much technology now and every game's on tv uh, but I can remember coming home on CBS, listening to Pat Summerall and John Madden, they'd be up in Giant Stadium. And I was really, I really liked Phil Sims. I got an autograph ball of Phil Sims uh, when he came to the Colts one day when I was there. But uh, I really, as a kid, you know, you know, I, I obviously like Joe Montana, but, you know, like Phil Sims was like, he was from a small school that went to Moorhead that was in the OVC that I was, that I played in. And I always, you know, just liked his toughness, um, you know, he played for the Giants. He played for a hard hit coach and Bill Parcells, and he was kind of my guy growing up. One flash, he just just was a winner. And then last, what was your favorite moment of your NFL career? I, I think the favorite moment I had, I can remember me and my wife crying, man, because because it was the first time that I made the Indianapolis coach football team. I, you know, we were. I can remember going to church that morning, and it was the last cut day, and. You know, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd already lived through that with the Tampa Bay Bucks when the guy called and, you know, said, hey, you know, coach needs to see you and bring your playbook. You know, that's kind of the standard deal. And, and everybody says, hey, when, you know, that's that's the deal there. So when I saw an Indianapolis coach call, uh, it was actually my quarterback coach, Buddy Geis. And uh, he called me and scared me to death because I'm like, you know, no news is good news sometimes. But but sometimes when you get the news and when somebody's calling you, you know, we had just walked out of church and got in, got in, got on the road to go eat something. And uh, I got this call and, and Buddy goes, you know, as as Lindy and as, as, as Lindy talked to you. And I was like, no, Lindy hadn't talked to me. I was like, you know, my heart had stopped. And he's like, well, he was going to call you, man. You, you, you know, just sound surprised, but you made the team. And I'm like, we. I hung up the phone on and we jumped for joy in the car, man, because that was that was kind of the first, you know, and it was it was kind of like that for the first three three years, man. You really don't know, but then you know when you when you kind of make a name for yourself and you you hung on for a while and then you start playing a little bit and then you start playing quite a bit, you know, you kind of know how things are going and you know that, you know, when I got to Cleveland, I knew I was going to make the team, so you didn't have to worry about that, you know, you didn't have to worry about that stuff, but you know, it was a uh, it was a long way coming, and, you know, that was probably the most exciting moment that my wife and myself had, you know, knowing that I made, you know, I'd worked so hard, 
and I was able to make the thing. All right, that's pretty much going to do it for this interview. I could talk to you for hours, Kelly. It's been really fun. Um, well, we, it, man. No problem. Absolutely. Anytime, man. Just call me. Before we uh, end this, is there anything you want to promote, like a website or Twitter page or a charity, something like that? Man, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I am not a tech guy. Like I told you, I don't even – I've got a – apparently I've got a Twitter page, but I don't even – I've been on it like once. I don't even know how to go on it. I've never been on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I, I don't know how to get on any of that stuff. So, man, I, I'm, uh, I, I just coach football here in Murfreesboro, man. Uh, I'm just kind of, uh, you know, I've been blessed. I've been blessed that I've been able to, I, I, I always tell my financial guy, I just want to be able to watch my kids grow up. And because uh, you're, you're away from them when you're playing, you're not like a coach, but you're still away from them when you're playing. And, uh, I've been fortunate enough to do that, man. I've been blessed beyond belief, and I've been fortunate enough to stay home. And you know, uh, I don't really have any charities, man. I, I just I do know this, like you know, my mom is uh, my mom is struggling with dementia. Uh, my my grandfather had dementia. He had Alzheimer's, and uh, you know, it's it's a very debilitating disease. And you know, if anybody can give that research for that, man, it's uh, you know that would be that would be awesome. Right on. Um, that sounds good. Kelly, once again, I thank you for doing this. It's been a pleasure. And like you said, maybe we'll talk again someday. Absolutely, man. Just give me a call anytime, brother. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. All right. Take care. Thanks, man. See you. Yep.